Good morning. It's Isaiah chapter 3 and 4. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is taking away from Jerusalem and Judah support and supply, all support of bread and all support of water, the mighty men and the shoulder, soldier, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty and the man of rank, the counsellor and the skilled magician and the expert in charms. And I will make boys their princes and infants to rule over them. And the people will oppress one another, everyone his fellow and everyone his neighbour. The youth will be insolent to the elder and the despised to the honourable. For a man will take hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have a cloak, you shall be our leader, and this heap of ruins shall be under your rule. In that day he will speak out, saying, I will not be a healer. In my house there is neither bread nor cloak. You shall not make me leader of the people. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen, because their speech and their deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him. For what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. My people, infants are their oppressors and women rule over them. O oh, my people, your guides mislead you and they have swallowed up the course of your paths. The Lord has taken his place to contend. He stands to judge peoples. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and princes of his people it is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people, by grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. The Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will lay bare their street secret paths, paths. In that day the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands, and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, and the scarves, the headdresses, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes, and the amulets the signet rings and nose rings, the festal robes, the mantles, the cloaks and the handbags, the mirrors, the linen garments, the turbans and the veils. Instead of perfume, there will be rottenness. Instead of a belt, a rope. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth and branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty men in battle. And her gates shall lament and mourn empty. She shall sit on the ground. And seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name and take away our reproach. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honour of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment, and by a spirit of burning. Then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day and smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. 
for over all the glory there will be a canopy. There will be a booth for shade by day from the heat and for a refuge and shelter from the storm and rain. Thank you, Barbara. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we uh, come to a passage like this and we wonder uh, what is it all about and, and uh, what relevance has it for us today. And yet as we study it and as we think about it, we see it has great relevance. So speak to us through your word this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, a couple of uh, weeks ago, um, or three weeks, I think it was, ago, Sam gave us a diagnosis about what was happening in, in Judah at the time of Isaiah, and it was a devastating a diagnosis. Uh, Judah had been nurtured and raised by God. Uh, uh, it was his, his chosen child, so to speak, and yet they have chosen to rebel and, and turn away from uh, God. And as we saw last week, the once faithful city of Jerusalem had now become an unfaithful uh, city. Uh, righteousness that had once resided uh, in Jerusalem, now there were murderers. Uh, their princes had become rebels and were mixing with thieves. They failed to look after the poor, the disadvantaged, the widows and the, the, the orphans. And so God was going to bring judgment upon this city, on this, on this nation. He was going to bring judgment because he desired to uh, purify them. He wanted to smelt away the dross. He wanted to restore uh, uh, the proper judges and counsellors so that the, the city uh, would be called righteous and be a faithful city. In chapter 2, we, we saw that uh, this would happen in the latter days and Jerusalem would be lifted up and, and nations would flock to hear the word of God in Jerusalem. Reconciliation would take place. Uh, nations would lay down their weapons. There would be peace and rest. And I said, we long for that time, don't we? But Isaiah gives this huge warning. There is coming the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, a day when God would judge the earth with such terror that those things that, <coughs> that we thought were important, those idols that uh, we worshipped or people worshipped uh, would be wiped away and all that's left is God's glory and his majesty. And my plea was that we needed to walk in the light of eternity, that the day of the Lord needed to be a warning to us and that we needed to focus on that faithful city, on that new creation that God would usher in on the last days. And so we move to chapter 3 and chapter 4 because Isaiah continues to prophesy God's redemptive plan for the human race. Uh, he continues to bring his diagnosis on, on Judah in order that there may be a cure. And this is what he's doing this morning. He's diagnosing uh, Judah's situation and then he gives the cure. And it seems that all the way through the book of Isaiah, uh, this is how Isaiah works. Isaiah wants us here to engage with the symptoms, and he wants us to go with him to the root cause of the disease, and then he offers the cure. Now, let me offer a, a word of uh, caution here. Often when patients uh, are given a diagnosis, uh, they can do a number of things. They can deny there is a problem. And I know uh, people that uh, have uh, denied that there was a problem. Uh, they've uh, left the hospital and uh, 
believe that uh, there wasn't a problem. Or they can get angry with God, angry with people, just angry about their situation, or they can become depressed and go into their shell, and I've seen that happen. Or they can pretend that the diagnosis is not as bad as the doctor says. Unfortunately, I think uh, these are all uh, uh, common to uh, spirituality as well. Uh, We can deny the problem of sin within our lives. We can get angry with God, and I've seen people do that, or we can get terribly depressed about our lives. Or we can pretend the problem is not as bad, and often we get that backed up by friends or even by parents. You know, I guess this sermon may be a little bit hard-hitting today, and, and this is a forewarning of what our, your hearts might try to do. Uh, you see, we all are prone to, to do that, uh, uh, to deny the problem, to get angry, or uh, to pretend we're not as bad as we think. So let's look at uh, this passage, and uh, uh, there are four points, three are to do with the diagnosis, and the last one to do with the cure. So firstly, the, you know, the diagnosis, and the first uh, point that I make is d- disorder and disintegration. Disorder and disintegration. Look at verses 1 to 7. You know, uh, this chapter in some ways reflects what's happening in our society today. Um, Look at verse 1. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is taking away from Jerusalem and from Judah support and supply, all support of bread and all support of water. So God is, is bringing judgment upon this land of Judah. He's taking away those things that they so vitally need, food and water. Here is this uh, reasonably prosperous uh, nation losing uh, these vital supplies of food and water. But that's not all uh, God is taking away. Look who else he's taking away, verse 2 and 3. The mighty men and the soldiers, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50, the, the man of rank, the sk- counselor, uh, the skillful magician or uh, skillful craftsman, I think, is a, is a better understanding, the expert of charms. Now, all these people were important uh, to Judah, Soldiers were those who who protected the people, the the judges, people who were to bring justice and righteousness uh, to the nation. The prophet was the one who was to bring the word to the people, and the counselor and the skillful craftsman, they're all there, they're important people, they're the symbols of power. Uh, These people were supposed to bring order to society, and God is taking them away. God is taking them away. In fact, look what happens. These symbols of power, they look powerful, but they're weakened. Verse 4, And I will make boys their princes, and infants shall rule over them. You see, this is what happens when societies disintegrate. Children start ruling the roost. And of course, we see the very same thing happening within our own society, don't we? Young people getting their own way. Young people going on ram raids because they know they can get away with it. Taking cars, smashing through windows of shops and stealing things. Kids staying away from schools because there is no order in the home. We have child-centered homes these days where children rule the roost where it's encouraged. This is modern-day parenting. But it goes even further. You know, even in the halls of power, places like the United Nations Assembly, we have young people getting up and lecturing people like Greta Thunberg and so forth, speaking and, and everybody bowing down and worshipping uh, these young people. Infants telling the adults what to do. 
Society in Isaiah's time was so disordered, so disintegrated and weak that a mere child could come along and cause havoc and mayhem. It's a pessimistic uh, society or picture that, that Isaiah is painting. And then look at verse 5. And the people oppress one another. Everyone his fellow, everyone uh, his neighbor. The youth will be insolent to the elder, the despised to the honorable. Uh, these are all the, uh, the normal social conventions starting to be reversed because uh, if the call is to love your neighbor, here it is to oppress your neighbor. Oppress your neighbor. Here we see that, that rather than people be respected, here the elders are being mocked. And this, of course, comes home again and again and again within our society, doesn't it? Uh, there seems little respect for those uh, in authority. Police are called pigs. More and more teachers are being abused physically in the schools. You know, this came home to me uh, about 20 years ago when my kids were playing soccer. Uh, they would go to a, a soccer practice and the coach would try and teach them or learn some new uh, trick or move or whatever they did. And I noticed that he'd always get one of my sons to demonstrate the move again. And I asked him why. And he said that they were the only boys that listened. That's why. Even back there 20 years ago. They were the only boys that listened. And my kids weren't perfect, but not by a long shot. You see, this is what happens when society begins to disintegrate. It, it becomes leaderless. It's like uh, uh, those pillars of society are, are gradually dismantled and pulled down, and society becomes rudderless. Paul put it so well in Romans 1, 28 following, and he says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to a debased mind to improper conduct. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gives them over to a base mind, to improper. And what happens? They are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetous, mal malice. This is what's happening in our society. This is what's happening in, when Isaiah is talking to, to the people of Judah. Unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. You know, when I was a kid, uh, uh, there used to be about a murder once a year. Today, the murders, and it'd be over the front page and everywhere. But here it's on about the fourth page of the Herald, I think happens every day. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. You see, this is what happens when people don't acknowledge God anymore. There's a breakdown in, a, in society. God judges us, hands us over to our own devices, and we get further and further into trouble. You know, Isaiah goes on. He, 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 he gives this diagnosis. Verse 6, For a man will take hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have a cloak, you shall be our leader. And this heap of ruins shall be under your rule. It's a description of a society that is disintegrated. You can see the disorder in the society. Society is leaderless. It's like a heap of ruins. It has been taken apart brick by brick, stone by stone. Uh, the structures are gone. Now, the time when, when Isaiah is writing this particular passage is that Judah looked quite prosperous. It felt prosperous. It seemed the border seemed even okay. There was a, a large army in the north, the Assyrian army, uh, but people were sort of living it up. We see that in the previous chapter. In chapter 2, verse 7, it says that their land is filled with silver and gold and there's no end to their treasures. Their land is filled with horses. There's no end to their chariots. They got all the latest mod cons. 
This is a prosperous nation, a nation seemingly doing well, and here Isaiah brings his judgment on this nation. I wonder how they felt. Yet Isaiah is pointing out to them the the disorder and the disintegration of that society. It's a society that failed to acknowledge God, that defied God, that left God on the sidelines. And in some ways our nation is not much different. We have failed to acknowledge God and God has given us over to a base mind, to improper conduct. You know, one of the things that encourages me as this church is getting, uh, is growing bigger and bigger. People are wanting to hear the word of God. People are seeing the folly, folly of the world out there and following after the world. But you know, in our society, we see this breakdown, don't we? Why is it that some young people just fail to respect their elders anymore? So many of our young people. Why is it that we hardly know our neighbours anymore? What is it when those social conventions start to be undone? You see, this is what happens when society begins to turn away from God and reject Him. Brick by brick, stone by stone. It begins to fall apart. And I want to suggest to you this morning that this is not just something that I feel, but I'm sure many of you feel the same way about our society that we live in. You have the same concerns that I have. This disorder and this disintegration. Secondly, there's sin and shamelessness. Sin and shamelessness, verses 8 to 11. Uh, look, at verse, look at verse 8. For Jerusalem has stumbled, Judah has fallen, because their speech and their deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. That's the definition of sin, isn't it? Their speech and their deeds are against the Lord. They defy his glorious presence. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of, uh, glory of God. Here is, is the definition of sin. But I want to say that's even worse than this. There's a shamelessness about what they do. They don't care about their sin. Look at verse 9. For for the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. They enjoy what they're doing. They enjoy sin. The look on their faces shows that. They think they're expressing their, their liberty. They think they're being enlightened. They parade their sin like Sodom. They're proud of what they do. They flaunt their sinfulness. Does does that not sound familiar? Is this what our society is doing? It disgusts me when I see gay parades and our politicians pandering to it. I hope it disgusts you too people flaunting their sinfulness. There's a shamelessness about it. A shamelessness. A while back I watched as a murderer was sentenced to life imprisonment and uh, there there was no remorse, there was just shamelessness. You know, he didn't care about the people that he had hurt or affected. I see the way uh, people flaunt their bodies these days and I may seem old-fashioned by some, but I think again that, that people seem shameless. When the moral compass of our society becomes so distorted, it's not that people just sin, but there's a shamelessness about their sin, isn't there? And when this happens, society is in a sorry state. Sociologists note the shifts of morality that occurs, and they occur in the following stages. First, it says, uh, first of all, we, we question the moral boundary. That's what society does, questions the moral boundaries. Then a minority begins to break the moral boundaries. 
And then the majority finally declares that it's, that it's not the moral boundaries that, uh, that they're breaking, but the former moral boundaries are immoral. They start calling good bad and bad good. There's a total reversal of morality. Now note in this passage, they parade their sin like Sodom. What was Sodom's sin? It was sexual perversion. They parade it. How does our society fare? How does our society fare? In a, a Gallup poll taken uh, in 1969, it said about 70% of people thought that premarital sex was wrong. That was the dominant consensus. Today, it is low as 10 to 13 percent. So you can see the way that, that moral standards have been chipped away, chipped away, and today, uh, 70 percent of people uh, say that, that marital sex is no longer uh, an issue anymore. Can you see what's happening? Good is being called bad, and bad is being called good. There's an erosion of standards, and society prides itself. It thinks that uh, it is enlightened, uh, that there's a sexual liberty. Isaiah sees what's happening here, and he makes a diagnosis. He says there's sin and shamelessness. And thirdly, he, he says that there is pride and punishment. This is 12 to 26. And I think that the, the central issue of uh, these verses is pride. Look at verse 16. Uh, the Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet, and so forth. Some of you might be thinking, well, Isaiah's picking on women here, isn't he? But if you read Isaiah, he also picks on men pretty, pretty big as well. But I also want to say that it's, it's not the fashion that is wrong here. It's the arrogant spirit that has prompted it. They're, they're haughty. They're arrogant. And it's the same with the leaders in verse 12 where it says, your guides have led, us, led you astray. These are leaders who are supposed to be pointing them to the Lord, but they're misleading them. And the result of this in, in verse 13 says, the Lord stands to, to judge the people. This is the one who is truly high and lifted up, the one who is exalted. He's going to come and he's going to judge you. You know, there's a great deal of pride around today. You hear in the rhetoric, make America great again. Make New Zealand great again. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. You know, pride comes before a fall, as they say. In fact, pride is a fall. For it places oneself ahead of the Creator God. It is the pride that says that, that I am my own moral authority. It's the pride that says that I can do what I want to do and no one's telling me otherwise. It's the pride that says I am a self-made man. How ridiculous. It's the pride that says we are the ultimate authority. You often <laughs> blame the Enlightenment uh, period for this but I know that pride has been around since sin began. But it was in the Enlightenment period that we pushed God right out of the picture and we, we enlightened ourselves, we thought we did. And two things happened in that period. First, we said that morality is something uh, that uh, humanity can work out on our own. We, we can do it by reason or we can do it by our experience, you know. That is, the Bible is no longer needed because we have reason and we have our experience. 
And the second thing it said is that science and te technology is the way we can control the, the world these days. No longer do we need God's sovereign and gracious hand. Well, we can control the world with science and technology. Now, don't get me wrong, reason and experience and science and technology are wonderful things that can be used for God's glory. But when we exalt them over God, they become dumb idols. Dumb idols. This is why sociologists always miss the mark. They come up with these uh, uh, sociological ideas and answers, and they forget that the real issue that is facing every human being is a, is a theological issue. It's to do with the human heart. It's the problem of sin and the need for God. Listen to what Francis Schaeffer says. He's a great thinker. And he talks about how we, we take God out of the picture. And I quote, he says, if, if man is not made in the image of God, then nothing stands in the way of inhumanity. Nothing stands in the way of inhumanity. There is no good reason why mankind should be perceived as special. Human life is cheapened. We can see this in many of the major issues and debates in our society today. Abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, the increase of child abuse and violence of all kinds. Pornography, the routine torture of political prisoners, all have their roots in the rejection of God. See, the diagnosis is severe. And I want you to see who gets impacted the most when society goes like this. It says, the Lord will enter into judgment with the elders, in verses 14 and 15, uh, with the elders and the princes of, uh, princes of uh, his people. It, it is you who have devoured the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. Uh, what do you mean by crushing my people, by grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord of hosts. It's always the poor that gets downtrod. They get the harshest treatments. It constantly happens. We watch the wealthy elites grow even more wealthy and the poor get even more poorer. Listen to what happens, verses 24 and 25. Instead of perfume, there's going to be rottenness. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, baldness. Instead of a rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword, your mighty men in battle. And her gates shall lament and mourn empty. She shall sit on the ground. In other words, the proud will be brought low. It is God who rules, God who is sovereign, and he will have the last say. The women who flaunted their perfume and their, uh, and their looks will be brought low. The men who thought uh, that by their own power they could save themselves will be brought low. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. The Lord longs that we trust him, that we follow his word, no matter how difficult it seems, that we might escape the terrifying and comprehensive judgment that will come. Lastly, we come to the cure. The cure, chapter 4. Look at verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. It's like a breath of fresh air, isn't it? In that day when the Lord comes, he shall be beautiful and glorious. Not the disorder and not the disintegration that we see in the previous chapter. He shall be beautiful. He shall be glorious. Why will he be beautiful and glorious? Look at verses 3 and 4. And he who 
is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning. He will be beautiful and glorious because of the salvation that he brings. Of course, that's not the only reason, but, but certainly we see that in, a, in salvation that he brings, that, that he, there is such beauty and, and so much glory. No more guilty conscience, no more lying awake wondering whether the past deeds are going to catch up with you. No more having to erase your browser history in case someone uh, comes and, and looks at it and sees what you have been watching on your computer. This is a cleansing, total forgiveness. This is God throwing away all your sins and not remembering them anymore. You will be called holy. You will be set apart for God. You are clean. All that filth has been washed away. And all those horrible things you have done to others will be purged and washed away. Then look at verses 5 and 6. It gives us a picture of the new, what the new creation will be like. It says, Then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over her assemblies, a, a cloud by day and a smoke and shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy. There will be a booth for shade by day from the heat and for a refuge and a shelter from the storm and the rain. Here we're told that the glory of the Lord will be a canopy over the new Jerusalem. The Lord will be manifest in this new creation. No wonder he is beautiful. No wonder he is glorious. His glory is going to be over the whole earth. And we will be protected and provided for. You know, it's interesting, you go to chapter 6 of Isaiah, and, and Isaiah has this wonderful vision of Christ high and lifted up, and, and Isaiah is caught up in that vision of God's majesty. He sees the cherubim and uh, seraphim uh, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And then he looks at himself, and he says, woe is me. Cursed am I for a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a, of a crooked and, and perverse generation. For Isaiah, at that time, God's glory was a fearful thing. Cursed am I, he says. But here in this chapter, it's a glorious thing when, when Christ uh, makes a new heaven and a new earth. Here our sins are washed away, cleansed, we are holy people. And how does the Lord do it? Verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. Who is the branch of the Lord? If you flick over to chapter 11, verse 1, it says, There shall come forth a, a shoot from the stump of Jesse. A branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Who's the branch? It's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. This is who Isaiah is speaking about. Someone from the line of Jesse. Someone from the line of, of David. Jesus comes. And on the cross, he takes our place. On the cross, he becomes our substitute. Dies in our place that, that we might escape the judgment of God. He atones for our sin. He dies in our place. This is where our hope must be. Only Jesus can bring lasting peace. Only Jesus can take away sin. Only Jesus can guide us and lead us in righteousness. He's the answer to all our problems. Have you put your trust in him this morning? Are you following him? Is he your Lord and Saviour? Let's pray.
Lord, we just uh, thank you that you came to this earth and died on a cross for us. that our sins might be forgiven, that we might be washed clean. We thank you that uh, we can escape the judgment to come when we put our trust in you because on the cross you paid the price. You took our place died our death that we might have life. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.